Right, well, good morning, everyone. I think we're going to make a start this morning. So I just want to um, wish everyone a really, really warm welcome. It's really good to see you all today. Thanks. We're going to spend some time in, in worship, in praise to God. And we're also going to share communion together this morning. So that will be later on in our service. And this morning, Mark is with us. Mark is going to be uh, bringing a message. We're carrying on our series in John. And today we're led to John chapter 8. And Mark is going to be taking us through that chapter and focusing on um, the subject before Abraham was I am and the direct debate regarding Jesus's identity. So just, um, before we start with a song, I want to take us to Psalm um, 42. Psalm 42 says, as the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with God? My tears have been my food day and night. While people say to me all day long, where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I used to go to the house of God under the protection of the mighty one with shouts of joy and praise among the festive throng. Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my saviour and my God. My soul is downcast within me. Therefore, I will remember you from the lands of the Jordan, the heights of Hermon, from M Mount Mizar, deep calls to deep in the roar of your waterfalls. All your waves and breakers have swept over me. By day, the Lord directs his love. At night, his song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why must I go about mourning, oppressed by the enemy? My bones suffer mortal agony as my foes taunt me saying to me all day long, where is your God? Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my saviour and my God. And we would just uh, remember that this morning, wouldn't we, as we're here together. Um, I don't know how your week's been. I, I know something of what's going on uh, with, with the people uh, of HIC, obviously, but um, I don't know whether you've had a good week, whether you're feeling like the writer of this psalm saying to yourself, why my soul are you downcast? And yet we remember we have a hope, don't we? We have a hope um, that God is with us. God is for us. We know that he loves us and we, we can put our hope in him. And we are here this morning to praise him as well. So I just want to start with a song. It's really a call to worship um, and it's all who are thirsty and it just invites us to come to God if we are thirsty this morning and it also invites uh, God to just dwell with us as we spend time together in worship. All who are thirsty So 
So our, our focus for this morning is going to be on uh, John chapter 8. So that's what Mark, the message that Mark will be bringing us later on. So we're just going to start before we continue uh, kind of in worship and with um, sung worship. I want to ask um, Mark Ramos is just going to come up and he's going to read the first part of John chapter 8 for us and just think a little bit about what um, that tells us. What I'm about to read to you is quite powerful. It really hit me here when I, when I read it. And I might stop and just expand on what, on what I've read. I'm reading from a slightly different Bible to the ones you've got. So it might not be exactly how it's written in your, in your Bibles. So this is chapter eight. So Jesus went unto the Mount of Olives. And early in the morning, he came again into the temple and all the people came unto him. And he sat down and taught them. And the scribes and the Pharisees brought unto him a woman who had been unfaithful, or more than just unfaithful. Okay, and they actually said to him, they said, Master, this woman was caught in the very act. In, in the Bible I've got on the app, it doesn't say she was caught in the act, but in this one it actually said that she was actually caught in the act. Um, now Moses in the law commanded us that such an act, or whoever's committed that act, should be stoned to death. Think about it. Stoned to death. Must be absolutely awful. So you can imagine how she's feeding. So she's probably nervous, shaking, sweating. Okay. And then they said to Jesus, what sayest thou? So it's like it's a challenge to Jesus. This woman has done this. She slept with somebody else outside of, of the marriage. Moses has said, if somebody does this, they should be stoned to death. But, but what sayeth thou? So this is the challenge to Jesus. They're challenging Jesus. They're almost setting a trap for Jesus. Anyway, Jesus at that point didn't say anything. He just bent down and wrote something on the ground. We don't know what he wrote, but it was something on the ground. He then stood up. And guess what he said? This, this is brilliant. This is what he said. He said, he who, who is without sin, cast the first stone. Think about that. Think about that. That's really, really powerful. He who is without sin, cast the first stone. So when they heard it, I mean, they must have thought to themselves, yeah, he's actually right here, what he said. They left. They left the temple from the oldest to the youngest. They always seem to do it in that sort of an order. There's always an order here. But they, they literally just left. So Jesus was then left alone with the woman because the mob had gone. And he said to the woman, where, are, where is the man who's actually said that you've done this or the men that said that they've done this? And she said, no man, Lord. No man has said that, that I've done this. And Jesus said, well, neither do I. I do not condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Think about that. She was going to get stoned to death. She was actually going to get stoned to death. And if you think, oh, yeah, but that took place thousands of years ago. Oh, no. Things like this happen now. It's happening even today. People are getting stoned to death for this very crime. It's not something that just happened thousands of of, of years ago. Now, I, I actually read this. I read it once. I read it twice. And then I read it for the third time. When I read it for the third time, two things struck me like two bolts of lightning. The first one was if she had, had actually done this, she couldn't have done it alone. So where was him? Where, where, was, where, was, where was the man in, in this? How come it's always a woman that has to be punished? Where's the man? It's true, isn't it? Where, where is he? So, um, but then you have to remember back in those days, women didn't have any rights whatsoever. You know, it's only recently women have actually been given the right to vote, the right to work, et cetera, et cetera. That's the first thing that struck me. Second thing that's, that struck me, and really this struck me a lot later, I, I kind of thought to myself, hmm, if you look at America, so you look at like the Bible Belt, so you're looking at states like Florida, North Carolina, South Carolina, going the whole way to Texas, right? So that's basically called the Bible Belt. Where do they kill people? 
in America. It's the Bible Belt. It's the exact same place. So they're saying, well, the Bible backs us up. But I'm saying, no, it doesn't. No, it doesn't back you up. It does not back you up. If someone's committed a heinous crime, put them in jail for life. But don't kill them. Because Jesus, uh, God created us all. We were all created by God. So what gives me the right to kill somebody else or you the right to kill somebody else? It doesn't give any of us the right to kill anybody, regardless of what they've, they've done, even if they've committed murder. It doesn't give us the right to then kill them. Two wrongs do not make a right. Put them in jail for life. Don't put them in jail for 15 years and then release them. Put them in jail for life. So I thought about those, those two powerful points there. Um, and I thank Alice for giving me the chance to, to speak on that one. Thank you very much, Mark. And it's really good. Just, I don't know, as, as you read, just thinking about what struck Mark, I'm thinking about what struck me. I wonder what struck you as those verses were read. Um, I suppose the big question is, as we read the first part of John, it's uh, what did he write? Yeah, what did he write? And I know there's lots of different theories on, on what was written in the sand. What did Jesus do that, that, that made them realize how sinful they were, made them realize that they, they didn't have the authority to stone this woman as Mark has just been thinking about with us. So I wanted to just reflect on this a little bit. Uh, and as I do, I'd like to share the words of a song, um, but I just like to read it as a poem. And the song just thinks a little bit about uh, the meaning behind what Jesus was doing here and about how uh, it still applies to us as, as Mark has just been thinking. So um, if you just listen to this uh, poem, it's called Scribbling in the Sand. Uh, I don't know if you've heard of it before. It's by a, a songwriter called Michael Card, um, but I just like to read the words as a poem. So it says this, amidst a mob of madmen, she stood frightened and alone as hate-filled voices hissed at him that she should now be stoned. But in the air around him hung a vast and wordless love. Who knows what luminous lesson he was in the middle of. At first he faced the fury of their self-righteous scorn, but then he stooped and at once became the calm eye of the storm. It was his wordless answer to their dark and cruel demand, the lifetime in a moment as he scribbled in the sand. It was silence, it was music, it was art, it was absurd. He stooped and shouted volumes without saying a single word. The same finger of the strong hand that had written 10 commands for now was simply scribbling in the sand. Could that same finger come and trace my soul's sacred sand and make some unexpected space where I could understand that my own condemnation pierced and broke that gentle hand that scratched the words I'll never know written in the sand. And I'm going to uh, just follow that up with a song. I've called it a meditation song, really. I don't expect us to be singing it together, but just to be listening, to be reading the words as they come up on the screen and, and maybe just to, to think about it. This story really just hit me and made me realize, uh, just, just made me reflect on my own sin, on my own weakness, and on uh, the kind of amazing contrast between um, God's humanity and God's power, his divinity. So as we, it might be a bit of a strange song. You might think, why would you um, share this kind of song on a Sunday morning, you know, in a worship service? But um, I just really think it helps us to just reflect on what Jesus did by coming into the world and giving his life. So we'll listen to this song. It's called Jesus, Friend of Sinners. Jesus, friend of sinners, we have strayed so far away. We cut down people in your name, but the sword was never ours to swing. Jesus, friend of sinners, the truth's become so hard to see. The world is on their way to you, but they're tripping over me. Always looking around and never looking up, I'm so double-minded. A plank-eyed saint with dirty hands and a heart divided. Jesus, friend of sinners, open our eyes to the world at the end of our pointing fingers. Let our hearts be led by mercy. Help us reach with open hearts 
and open doors Oh Jesus, friend of sinners Break our hearts for what breaks yours fall from their hands help us to remember we are all the least of these let the memory of your mercy bring your people to their knees nobody knows what we're for only what we're against when we judge the wounded what if we put down our signs crossed over the lines and love like you did and his humanity is beautiful. He cares, loves, and shows mercy to those whom society deems does not belong. And so the, the word of the song, the, the lyric of the song that I want to leave you with is this, that let the memory of your mercy, let the memory of God's mercy bring your people, bring us to our knees. And this morning we, we should be really on our knees. We should be humbled in our hearts as we think about God's amazing love as we think about the love that Jesus showed. So I just want to invite us now just to um, sing these songs together. I've got two songs that we can just sing as we think about uh, God's love and as we think about um, the example that Jesus gave us as he lived on this earth, as he, um, as he showed us what it's like to be, to be perfect. He showed us his divinity and also his humanity. So um, we've got two songs, Here is Love and What a Beautiful Name. So if you'd like to stand. As you... Here is love as does the ocean, loving kindness as the flood. 
In the prince of a life our ransom Shed for us his precious blood Who is love will not remember Who can cease to sing his praise He will never be forgotten Throughout heaven's eternal day Christ. 
Um, we're just going to continue our worship as we uh, share communion together. And I'd like to read some verses from um, Romans chapter 8 as we just reflect on, on the songs that we've just sung uh, and on what we're doing as we take communion as well. So we had a, some, some of the words of the song we just sang said, My sin was great, your love was greater. What could separate us now? Um, and it just reminded me of, of course, those verses in Romans chapter 8. Just read from verse 31 um, down to 39. So Romans chapter 8, starting at verse 31. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus, who died, uh, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And as we come to take communion together this morning, we just are reminded again, aren't we, about uh, Calvary. We're reminded about the cross and a, a moment where the human and the divine, they came together in the greatest act of love and obedience. And he who knew no sin would become sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. Unbounded grace and undeserved favor. And as we looked at those verses, uh, it said, who will condemn us? Who, uh, who then is the one who condemns? No one. Yeah, we are not condemned. As, uh, the same as what we've been thinking in uh, John chapter 8. Uh, nobody could condemn that woman. Jesus didn't allow them to. And this morning, we are not condemned either. Instead, we have this love, this amazing love uh, that God has given us as a gift. Unbounded grace, undeserved favor. And as we think about that, as we think about the gift that God has given us through Jesus. Uh, we are just humbled again this morning as we take the bread and we take the wine. Um, the words of a very famous hymn say this, no condemnation now I dread, Jesus and all in him is mine. Let's just pray together as we prepare to take the, the bread and the cups. So Father, we just want to thank you again. Um, we can be so uh, we can be lacking so much humility sometimes when we come here on a Sunday morning. Sometimes we take communion. We don't stop and think um, about our own weakness, about our own sinfulness, Lord. Um, and we're just challenged by that story that we read in John chapter 8. It's not a story, something that really happened when you were here on earth, Lord. And we just thank you that uh, despite our sin, you still love us. You didn't um, let that woman be stoned as we we're thinking about. You just... Uh, um, showed her this amazing grace, amazing grace and undeserved favor that you show to us as well, Lord. And this morning we want to just acknowledge our sin, Father. Sometimes we don't like to think about uh, the wrong that is in us. Sometimes we like to think that uh, we're good Christians and we and we do the right thing and we say the right thing and we're trying our best. But Lord, at the heart of it, we know that um, we are sinful and we just want to just acknowledge that in your presence this morning, Lord, and just acknowledge that we did need a savior we needed Jesus to show us uh, what it was like to be perfect to show us um, how much we have fallen short and and ultimately just to go to the cross and give up his life for us so that we could be reconciled um, to God the father and we just thank you this morning Lord for each one who has accepted this gift father we just thank you that we have a way um, this morning that we can just remember we can give thanks and we can just be obedient to you by sharing together the bread and by sharing the wine as well father just um just being obedient and also just remembering um, the cost and just remembering the sacrifice um, that took place there on the cross. So we just pray this morning, Father, that you would help us, help us to be humble before you, help us to just um, 
recognize that amazing love and just realize what we owe. And we know that we can never repay. It's a debt that we can never repay, but we know that we, we owe you our lives and we owe you our service and our worship. Um, so we just want to just um, give you thanks, Father, for, for the bread and for the cups this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. and majesty manhood and deity in perfect harmony the man who is God Lord of eternity dwells in humanity kneels in humility and washes our feet Oh God and meekness and Bow down and worship, for this is your God, this is your God, you are your And as they crucify, praise Father, forgive. Oh, all the mystery, meekness and majesty, bow down and worship, for this is your God, this is your Jesus' testimony. When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of light. The Pharisees challenged him, Here you are, appearing as your own witness. Your testimony is not valid. Jesus answered, Even if I testify on my own behalf, my testimony is valid. For I know where I came from and where I am going, but you have no idea where I come from or where I am going. And then let's go to uh, John chapter 8, verses 21 to 24. Dispute over who Jesus is. Once more, Jesus said to them, I am going away and you will look for me and you will die in your sin. Where I go, you cannot come. This made the Jews ask, will he kill himself? Is that why he says, where I go, you cannot come. But he continued, you are from below, I am from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. I told you that you would die in your sins. If you do not believe that I am he, you will indeed die in your sins. Then let's go to John 8 verses 31 to 44. 
dispute over those whose children Jesus' opponents are. To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. They answered him, we are Abraham's descendants and have never been slaves of anyone. How can you say that we shall be set free? Jesus replied, very truly I tell you, everyone who sins is slave to sin. Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. I know you are Abraham's descendants, yet you are looking for a way to kill me because you have no room for my word. I am telling you what I have seen in the father's presence and you are doing what you have heard from your father. Abraham is our father, they answered. If you were Abraham's children, said Jesus, then you would do whatever what Abraham did. As it is, you are looking for a way to kill me. A man has told you the truth that I heard from God. Abraham did not do such things. You are doing the works of your own father. We are not legitimate children, they protested. The only father we have is God himself. Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me, for I have come here from God. I have not come on my own. God sent me. Why is my language not clear to you? Because you are unable to hear what I say. You belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Now let's go to John chapter 8, verses 48 to 59. Jesus claims about himself. The Jews answered him, aren't we right in saying that you are a Samaritan and demon possessed? I am not possessed by a demon, said Jesus, but I honor my father and you dishonor me. I'm not seeking glory for myself, but there is one who seeks it and he is the judge. Very truly, I tell you, whoever obeys my word will never see death. At this, they exclaimed, now we know that you are them possessed. Abraham died and so did the prophets. Yet you say that whoever obeys your word will never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham? He died and so did the prophets. Who do you think you are? Jesus replied, if I glorify myself, my glory means nothing. My father, whom you claim as your God, is the one who glorifies me. Though you do not know him, I know him. If I said I did not, I would be a liar like you. But I do know him and obey his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day. He saw it and was glad. You are not yet 50 years old, they said to him, and you have seen Abraham. Very truly, I tell you, Jesus answered, before Abraham was born, I am. At this, they picked up some, they picked up stones to stone him, but Jesus hid himself, sleeping away from the temple grounds. May the Lord bless the reading of his holy words. Thanks, Alice. And Mark as well for uh, leading us in reading and reflection uh, from that amazing story at the beginning of John chapter 8. And it has been good to reflect on that very graphic story of, of that woman brought before Jesus. And we have worshipped God who does not condemn, who could condemn, but does not condemn because he took himself the penalty of our sin. The interesting thing, of course, as you may have noticed in your Bible, is that in the original text of the Gospel of John, the story of the woman caught in the act of adultery is not there. It's amazing how this story, the first 11 verses of chapter 8, is a story that has, right to this very day, challenged, gripped every follower of Jesus to the extent that after hundreds of years, this story became accepted 
as part of the Gospel of John, even though our best evidence is that it wasn't in the original writing of the Gospel of John. Uh, and there is, of course, in there a certain mystery and a lot of discussion uh, that we can rightly have as to how exactly uh, do we have the text that we hold in front of us. But there are a number of reasons, and I want to explore one of them, why that story does belong here. And you may, of course, notice that at the end of chapter 8, they're trying to stone Jesus, whereas they began chapter 8 by trying to get Jesus to stone a woman. There are lots of reasons why this story, the, 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 the early church fathers clearly considered that that is where this story belongs. We are dealing with an authentic story, as, as Alice prayed in her prayer. It's not merely a story. It's something that actually happened in the life of Jesus, and the memory of it was retained by the Holy Spirit through people until eventually that story was placed here. But in one sense, it doesn't belong here. And um, Alice uh, ended by reading in chapter 7, verse 37 and 38. And we are in the middle of the Feast of Tabernacles. And, and in the middle of the Feast of, in fact, on the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood up and said in a loud voice, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. And then there's some conversation that goes on offline. It's not, Jesus is not involved in the next verses. It's some conversation that goes on between the Jewish people and their leaders, and it's about the identity, identity of Jesus, who is Jesus, and then there's the conversation with Nicodemus at the, chapter, uh, at the end of chapter 7. Then at the, chapter 8, verse 12, did you notice the reading started, when Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. And we're going to grapple this morning a little bit with the identity of Jesus. Clearly, the whole of chapter 8 is bringing a long conversation to a crescendo, to a climax, the question of who exactly are you, Jesus? And there's almost a desperation in the crowd, and, and certainly from the leaders of the Jews, because they are, I would suggest, to some extent, terrified, uh, to another extent, um, angry, jealous, uncertain. There's an incredible mixture of emotions, but what they want to know is, who are you, Jesus? Who are you? Because he's doing things that humans don't do and can only do with the power of God, the miracles and the signs that we've been looking at. They really wanted to know who he is. But Jesus turns the table at what we're actually going to look at this morning, and we began to do it already. While they're desperate to know who Jesus is, Jesus wants them to know, do they know who they are? We may know who Jesus is, but do we know who we are? And that's what chapter 8 is all about. Who is Jesus? In chapter 7, uh, Harry last week reminded us that some said he is a good man. Others said he deceives the people. And to add to that, of course, today in chapter 8, we read in verse 48, uh, some of them said, aren't you a, a demon-possessed Samaritan? I mean, the, the range of opinions as to who was Jesus is just quite incredible. A good man, deceiving the people, demon-possessed. And from that, I get the sense that there was a certain desperation rising a sense that here was someone who was different. The question is, how did he relate to God? Was he obedient to God and to God's laws? And, and the whole healing of the Sabbath had raised questions in their mind. What was his relationship with God? That he was evidently supernatural, had supernatural powers, was without doubt. Nobody questioned the existence of the miracles. They saw them with their eyes, but who exactly is he? And as Jesus seeks to reveal himself to them, there, there was, of course, a certain steady increase of understanding that was accurate. In, at the end of chapter 7, in that offline discussion that Jesus wasn't involved in, they said things like some of them said he is the prophet, the one that Moses had promised would come, and even the Messiah 
himself. And Jesus has been using a series of uh, I am statements in the Gospel of John to actually reveal himself. And I want us to just get back to where we were last week, if you were here last week, or back to chapter 7 in the Feast of the Tabernacles. Uh, and previously in chapter 6, a whole series of images that Jesus has been using. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world we have this morning. Later on, I am the door. I am the gate. I am the shepherd. A statement about himself using, you could say in a sense, common items like bread that we eat, but actually it was more than common items. He was using ancient stories in fact, the ancient story, the story of the Exodus. He was connecting himself with Moses and actually was saying, uh, in effect, that he was beyond Moses in his relationship with God. Back in chapter 6, uh, we read and discussed Jesus' words, I am the bread of life. You remember those two incredible miracles, uh, the feeding of the 5,000 and the walking on the water that so evidently was to remind those people of Moses and their greatest story, the story of the Exodus. And so that's why chapter 8 verse 12 began before that story got inserted in there, chapter 8, verse 12 began with a continuation on the theme. Jesus said, I am the giver of water. Harry reminded us last week of the water ceremony that took place every day in the Feast of Tabernacles, how they brought water up from the pool of Siloam and poured it out and praised God for his provision. Uh, God, who is the giver of water and that voice of Jesus that says, I am the giver of living water. And you begin to see that connection very strongly. That is a claim to deity. God is the giver of living water. Jesus said, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. And then again, he says in verse 12, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And this is one of the, the oldest of pictures or associations of God himself. The one who in the beginning said, let there be light. And there was light. The one who is the very source of light itself. During the, the Feast of Tabernacles, uh, the celebrations that Harry talked about, I, I read through his message from last week, I wasn't here myself, but the celebrations, the sheer joy of, of the Feast of Tabernacles, to extend that into the night, so to speak, they lit four huge lampstands in the court of women or, or the outer court of the temple. Uh, these were huge. You needed ladders to climb up to put the oil at the top and to light it as this picture tries to represent. And that's not electric lights. It, it was huge burning lamps. The festival uh, was associated not just with water, but with light. And you can imagine if we carry on the reading from chapter 7 on the last and greatest day of the festival, when for the last evening time they lit these enormous lamps and as the crowds in that courtyard bathed in the light of this burning, like four burning um, lampstands, Jesus' voice cuts across the top of the crowds and says, I am the light of the world. Not God is the light of the world, which they were celebrating, and the light that God brought into their lives, but I am the light of the world. And you notice that Jesus says, uh, whoever follows me will never walk in darkness. He's still with them. You see, they were Jews. They were celebrating uh, things that were associated with the Exodus and that journey with God in the wilderness and the way that God appeared and his presence was viscerally present with Israel in a way that we don't experience today. There was that pillar of fire, which at, in day it appeared to be a, a mountain cloud of darkness. Uh, but at night it shone with fire. In fact, in a sense, there was no night. 
in the wilderness because there was always light even when it was dark and even when their circumstances uh, were difficult the presence of god was a physical light and that light didn't only just tell them that god was with them uh, but also protected them sometimes that that pillar of fire went behind them when their enemies were coming and stood between the enemy and them and protected them and more often that light guided them when the light moved when the cloud moved the people had to move they had to pack up their tents and they had to start moving to wherever the light took them and that's the imagery here as Jesus says, I am the light of the world. I am the very source of all things. I am also the one you are to follow. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness. I, I, I believe we should take that this morning. Uh, that as we go on in our life as a church, many in our church are, have suffered bereavement recently and are working through perhaps dark and difficult times, confusing times. In, in a darkness that at times may overwhelm, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. If you follow me, you will never walk in darkness now he's not meaning that there will not be darkness there will be darkness he's not meaning that life will be easy but he's meaning that in the darkness you will have light and we pray with each other and, and encourage one another this morning as we do uh, across Europe into Ukraine and the countries there where many of God's people are walking in times of deepest darkness that they too may experience that as they follow the light, as they follow Jesus, then the darkness will be as light to them. There's a mystery in this. As we go through times of difficulty and challenge in our lives, the difficulties and challenges are not removed by the presence of Christ, but the presence of Christ guides us through the difficulties and challenges. That's the picture and concept that Jesus is, is on one hand trying to teach them. And this morning we receive this teaching as a great encouragement. If you sit here this morning as a follower of Jesus Christ, then you know whatever may come. To take ancient words, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because you are with me who is with you <laughs> and that of course is the incredible question in the ancient words it was Yahweh God God is with me Jesus is saying I am with you and because I am with you you can walk on into the darkness even the darkness of death itself wonderful expressions i am the bread of life i am the giver of living water the giver of the holy spirit i am the light of the world follow me and you will never walk in darkness as followers of jesus christ this morning we surely must rejoice to know that that this is who christ is to us and in many senses the i ams of scripture are there to teach us, uh, the I am's of Jesus, are uh, to teach us of something of who Jesus is uh, to us. Thinking about light, right at the beginning of the Gospel of John in chapter 1, and I think this is particularly needed for us to hear in the context of Europe of war, we said that the prologue of chapter 1 is, is in a sense a summary of the book. It's one of those prologues or introductions that tells you everything that's in the Gospel of John. And so we keep going back to some of the verses found in the first part of the Gospel of John, where John says, in him was life. And that life was the light of all humankind. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. And the, the certainty we can have with regards to Ukraine 
It's not that the war will end quickly, although we pray that the war will end quickly. It may drag on. It may develop into World War III. We have no idea of the darkness that may lie ahead. But what we do know is that the light of the truth of God and of Jesus Christ will not be overwhelmed or overcome, even in that context too. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness does not overcome it. The knowledge of the ultimate victory of Christ over all things. And so as Jesus uh, goes through on in this conversation, and we took a snap, couple of snapshots of chapter 8 and saw how the conversation is developing. So while we may draw comfort and encouragement from these I am statements of Jesus Christ, in, in a sense, Jesus is trying to say, explain who he actually is. He's trying to tell the truth. The complication, of course, is the truth is a very hard one to swallow. That Jesus has a unique connection with God. Uh, and in the Gospel of John, he's described as the only begotten of the Father or the one and only Son, the unique one. That Jesus actually has a relationship with God that is so close as to mean he is, as we worship him and worshiped him this morning in song, he is. God himself. And so you see Jesus struggling in chapter eight. On one hand, he's talking about himself. And then they say to him, well, you're just, you're just boasting. You're just, you're just your own witness. Why should we believe you? If you claim to have this relationship with God, you just appear to be your own witness. And Jesus is trying to say, no, there are many witnesses. And my father gives testimony towards the end of the chapter there. He said to you, he said to them, in effect, um, I know God. That is, I say, I have a relationship with God, a unique connection with God. I know God. If I said I did not, I would be lying to you. And we see Jesus in one sense struggling with how does he explain who he is to people like ourselves who can't conceive of a human being as being God. And let's face it this morning, I, I, I struggle with that concept. How, how can God, in the vastness of who he is, be contained in a human being who in historical terms and the historical evidence is there, if you want to look at it, lived 2,000 years ago on this earth, lived and died and historically evidenced, rose again from the dead. How does he explain who he is? He has been using these I am statements. I am the bread of life. I am the giver of living water. I am the light. Because all of those were functions or characteristics of God, which they knew. But we'll come to another one later on. I am the good shepherd. And you think of Psalm 23. Yahweh, God, is my shepherd. So all of these were ways of saying to the people who he was. But we read the ultimate, as we see here in chapter 8. In chapter 8, as the conversation goes on, I think it comes to that incredible climax where there's that conversation about Abraham. And they're claiming Abraham as their father. And Jesus knows that Abraham is their ancestor. And then Jesus starts those words, your father Abraham, verse 56, rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day. He sought and was glad. You're not even 50 years old. How could Abraham have seen you? And then Jesus comes out with those truly amazing words, which he has been building up to. He's been using that term, I am, not merely to describe his function, things that he can do, but actually his identity itself. Very truly, I tell you, Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am. Now, if we're not familiar with the Jewish scriptures, with the Hebrew Bible, that, that may kind of go over our heads. And I want us to understand this morning that, that that is the claim Jesus makes to be equal with God. There is absolutely no doubt. Some people say, well, Jesus never claimed to be God. He did a lot of good teaching, but he never claimed to be God. I tell you, in those words, the claim to be God is right in your face. And the reaction of the people is just so obvious. They heard what he said, and they understood what he said, 
and they picked up the stones to stone him because from their understanding, there was no other option. If a human claims to be Yahweh, God, the Almighty, then they're either deluded and they clearly didn't think realistically that Jesus was deluded, although some of them accused him of being demon possessed. They believed that he really believed and was really saying that he was the great I am. And it is only Jesus taking action because his time has not come. Otherwise, the story would have ended there with Jesus being stoned to death for claiming to be God. There is, in a sense, here we are at that question, which is the question. Understanding and accepting that Jesus claimed to be God, what are you going to do with that? What are you going to do? with the fact that Jesus is God. In our reading of the Bible and our understanding of, of the Christian faith, ultimately any fair reading of the New Testament comes to this point of realizing that Jesus claimed an equality with God that means he is God. Now, how we get our heads around Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and three being one, I, I accept with you that that's very difficult for us to understand, but there is no doubt that that is what Jesus was teaching. And if a human being who lived in history died and rose again in history claimed to be God, then having reached that point of understanding, we've got a really difficult decision to make. What are we going to do with that information? Are we going to just park it and say, okay, that's an interesting bit of information. I'll lock it away in, in my sort of uh, cupboard and yeah, Jesus is God. <laughs> I don't think you can do that. If he is God, then everything he says takes on a different dimension. And our response to what he asks us to do is really our response to God. And we'll be held accountable to God for how we respond to anything that Jesus says, if he is God. We have to do something about that. And it should profoundly change our world. And so sitting here, many of us committed followers of Jesus, has it profoundly changed our world? If not, there's a serious question to be asked. How seriously are you taking the truth that Jesus is the great I am? But as I said at the beginning, on one hand, Jesus was trying to explain his identity, but he knew that the bigger problem, or is it a bigger problem? It's an equally big problem is not understanding who Jesus is, but it's understanding who we are. And as we read through this chapter, you, you could see that he was dealing with people who were living under a delusion. Now, they said we are the children of Abram in chapter 8, verse 33, twice over, 33 and 38. Abram is our father. Uh, in a sense, they were quite clear as to their identity. They were Jews and they traced their ancestry back to Abraham. We are Abram's children. But did you notice what they said when Jesus said those words about the truth will set you free? They said we are Abram's descendants and we have never been slaves of anyone. There's the delusion, isn't it? The whole history of the Israel nation was a history of slavery. It began as slaves in Egypt and it ended up as slaves in Babylon. And even as they talked to Jesus, they were effectively slaves of the Roman Empire. How could you possibly say we have never been slaves of anyone? That's the problem with delusion, being deluded. You, you think you know, but you don't know. And you don't even realize that you don't know. So what was it that they didn't know that Jesus knew they needed to know? It was the sort of bluntness. And this, of course, bluntness of his words, this, of course, is, is a common thing that we all have today. I think as we go around our society, as we look into our own lives, too, generally we think as human beings we're essentially good. I mean, we, we don't do a lot of harm, and we, we largely, largely think we're free, at least in Western Europe. And that's perhaps what some of these wars are about, as we think. 
not realizing the level of delusion that humanity is living under. And Jesus has this bluntness in this chapter. I don't know if you noticed, it was almost quite jarring as we read chapter 8 near the beginning of chapter 8. Suddenly, out of nowhere, Jesus seems to say, I'm going away and you will look for me and you will die in your sin. That's pretty blunt. And you will die in your sins. Verse 24, I told you, you would die in your sins. If you do not believe that I am he, you will indeed die in your sins. That's why this morning, it was quite stark, perhaps, in a sense, reading that first story and worshipping in the way that Alice led us this morning, in the confession of our sin before God. And for many, the sin word is a, is a non-PC word. It's a word that when you use it, people cringe. And, uh, and sometimes as Christians, we cringe uh, to use the word. And we don't like to confess the truth that we are sinners before God. That's why while they are grappling with his identity, he is forcing them to understand their own identity, that they are sinners before God and slaved, enslaved by sin. Jesus said, hold to my teachings. Then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Very truly, I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. If the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Have we truly grasped our core identity? It's not pleasant words to speak it like this, but that we are sinners. From birth, through our life, even as followers of Jesus Christ, sin is still within us. As John says, if you claim not to sin, you're lying. And he was speaking to the church. He wasn't speaking to people on the street. That we are sinners before God. And it needs this action of Jesus that we hear the truth. You will know the truth. And the truth will set you free. It's one of the most misused phrases from Jesus. The truth will set you free. And yet we know there's a truth in it. If you're hiding something, it will inevitably cause a breakdown in relationships and cause attention. Uh, and when you open up and are honest and deal with the issue, there is a freedom in dealing with the truth rather than hiding away from the truth. But what Jesus is talking about here is the reality that the only one who can truly set us free is God himself. If the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. He's trying to convey to them, as he's conveying to us this morning, that sin, that, that rebelliousness, that, that essentially choosing to do my own thing. Once I stop following God and choose to do my own thing, I become a slave of doing my own thing. Until we sing the song, I did it my way. You, you get what I mean which is the ultimate expression of sin. I did it my way. That God knows as we step away from God and choose to go our way, we go into a, a, a domain where we are enslaved to doing our own thing, to doing it our way. And that self-centeredness in whatever the actions are is sin and it enslaves and there is no way out unless the Son sets us free unless christ jesus god the great i am this is the one who we now understand who he is and why he has to be god in order to set us free because only god can set us free from this type of slavery and how he needs to speak the word and that is why the story is placed at the beginning of chapter 8. And as I reflected on the scene that was captured, I think, graphically by the poem Alice read, the scene of this woman caught in adultery, and as Mark rightly pointed out, where's the guy? You can't catch a woman in the act of adultery without a man 
And so the hypocrisy, and that's why Jesus, in a sense, for lots of reasons, was confident to say, let he who is among you, did you notice the text is clear, let the one among you who is without sin, because he was without sin. If he had said, let anyone without sin cast the first stone, then Jesus would have had to have cast the first stone. Let anyone who is among you cast the first stone. As Jesus draws out their hypocrisy, the horror of this scene, which is replayed constantly, particularly by Christians. I'll be blunt there. We are brilliant at doing this, about dragging something, some sin into the middle and then expecting everyone to condemn that sin. Uh, and the song that Alice brought out, brought, brought out that really powerful really powerfully. What is Jesus saying here? We're familiar with this story from often the angle, well, it teaches us that we should hate the sin and love the sinner, that we should love the sinner and hate the sin. And, and, and th there is a truth in that, but that is not what this story is teaching us. And in fact, often we wrongly use that phrase in, in our desire to reach out to people with the love, the love of God, to love people, whatever they're doing. We, we, we try to express that love and distance ourselves from the sins that are being committed. And often we come over as patronizing and not very helpful but that's not actually what this story is teaching us about. For sure, God loves us as sinners, but hates our sin. Probably it's only God who can say that, to love the sinner and hate the sin. Because when we say it, we are sinners saying it. And I'm not quite sure what tone of voice we should be using when we try to say that. So what was Jesus doing here? Was he, as perhaps we may be thinking, uh, kind of saying to her, well, I don't condemn you now, but go and leave your life of sin. And if you don't leave your life of sin, then I'll condemn you later. Is that what Jesus was saying? Was he actually speaking words that essentially said, go and do better. Go and sin no more. It's up to you now. I've, I, I've prevented this condemnation. Now go and do better. Or was Jesus doing something far more powerful? I was struck, and I'll finish with this thought. I was struck with the parallel between the words that Jesus spoke to the paralyzed man in the temple and the words that he spoke to this woman. He said to the man in the temple, get up, pick up your mat and walk. To a man who was paralyzed, who could not stand up, who could not pick up his mat and walk, Jesus spoke healing words. And the man was enabled to pick up his mat and walk. Do you get that? The man couldn't get up and walk, but when Jesus said, get up and walk, he could get up and walk. So he spoke the same words to this woman. She couldn't leave her life of sin. She couldn't stop her adulteries, no more than you or I can stop the habitual sins that we are trapped in. Jesus couldn't say to her, go and stop sinning, because he knew she couldn't stop sinning. No one can stop sinning unless the Son of God speaks the word. And so he said to the paralyzed man, get up and walk, and enabled the man to get up and walk. So he spoke to this woman, go and leave your life of sin was not a, a, another commandment to follow. It was the enabling power that was going to give her the opportunity to leave her life of sin, an opportunity she would have never have had unless Christ had spoken the words to her. So it is knowing who Jesus is, and knowing what he speaks to us gives us the power to do what he's asking us to do. And it may be for some this morning, it is to leave your life of sin. Have you heard his voice? Are you free? For as we hear his voice speaking to us and respond to the son, then the son sets us free and if he sets us free then we are free indeed may god help us to grasp the power of christ 
so that we can live out what he is commanding us to do. And can it be?